ladies, gents, and non-binary events. I'm Jillian, and this amazing person is Susan Dennard, Hi. the author of the Witchland series, That's and my favorite author, oh. if you've been watching me for any time. Thank you, Jillian. Of course. So today, I have the honor of interviewing Susan after her Blood Witch event, and so we might be both a little flustered, so excuse us. Yeah, it was a long night, but we'll do our best. Yes. We'll do our best. So, I'm a nude. Yeah, it's great. Best way. So, my first question is, did you expect The Witchlands to take off the way it has? Like, before Truth Witch came out, like, there was a huge street team. Yes. And now there's an even bigger street it's team true. multiplied by, like, 40. Yes, it's big. It's, it's probably like five times bigger now. Um, yeah. No, I didn't expect Truth Witch to break out. I was desperate for it too because my career was not going well and I really, really needed a success or I was going to have to sort of start all over and change my name, which is a very common practice in the industry. Yeah. Uh, so I was very, very desperate and hopeful it would work. Uh, we had done the street team. Yes. And, it was so much fun. And I put all of my money and my time and my effort and passion into it. And it was so it. appreciated. And I appreciated everything that all of the members of the Witchlanders did. Uh, and it actually worked. We managed to make Truth Witch happen. It became a thing. And, it, and clan chats. Clan chats are so great. They're so amazing. They're these Twitter takeovers that we do, and they're really fun. And they get trending. They do. They're really, they trend worldwide, I think. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. So Yeah. Okay, question two is, how, how much harder is it to write the Witchlands when you don't have a cookie-cutter villain? When, in your previous series, Something Strange and Deadly, there you was had... a very clear villain, yes. yeah. Yeah, so the Witchlands is an interesting sort of challenge I set for myself in that I, I wanted to write a book with no villain. So often you hear the phrase, every villain thinks they're the good, good yeah. guy, and I wanted to actually say, well, what if every villain is a good guy? Yeah. What if there really is no villain and it's all about perspective and what lens you wear? So if you change the lens, your story changes and they're, they're not bad at all. So for example, Vivia in the first book. Yes. Uh, through Merrick's lens, she is an antagonist. She's not good. And then we get Vivia's lens in the next book and it is very different. Yes. Um, and so that's, that's something I wanted to explore. Um, in many ways, it was a much harder challenge than I anticipated. Um, having one or just a villain, someone whose very clear goal to bring down gives a story momentum and a, a direction to move in, and without yeah. that, it's much harder for me to keep the story on track and know where I'm going, but I put in the time and the effort to figure it out, and I hope you're going to enjoy. it's coming out so amazing so thank far. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Question four. In Something Strange and Deadly, there is a disability added to a major character. Would you do that in the Witchlands to a character, any character, major or side? And how would you go about doing it? Would it be a, phys a visible disability or an invisible disability? I mean, there's already a few various things. Like, there's a lot of mental health Yes. Um, that runs through, especially Vivia. Yes. Uh, but all of the... A number of characters have various versions, and there's not word, there's not terminology in the Witchlands. I can't call yeah. it anxiety. Yeah. So they have different words for it that they use to describe their feelings. Um, but yeah, and then I mean, that's something that I definitely want to explore. It's important to get it right. So we'll see if it's if the Witchlands is the right fit for it. I don't know yet. I but don't know I yet. do appreciate you putting disability and something strange and deadly and. Not making it the entire character's arc, and, and instead it just added to it. It was so beautifully done, Thank and you. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad. It means a lot. Okay. So, tonight we were talking about how the Witchlands has been optioned by the Jim Henson Company for TV. True. So, besides TV, would you like it to be adapted into a video game or a graphic novel? Of the two, I would choose video game. I'm a gamer. I'm a gamer. I love graphic novels, but I am a gamer. So being able to like see my world, interact with my world yeah. through a console would be probably the most amazing thing ever. I bet you that would be the thing to get me into gaming. Like, <laughs> you would be willing not, to game for the Witchlands. Like <laughs> I would be willing to like buy a console just to play I appreciate in the that. Witchlands. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, 
also, you studied marine biology in school. I did. How does your knowledge of marine biology affect the way you wrote your world and your creatures? That's a great question, and I'm glad you asked it, because I do spend a lot of time um, thinking about the world from an ecological standpoint. I was technically a marine ecologist, so I looked at ecosystems um, and the way they interact. And so when I'm building my world, that's where I start. I think about the physical landscape, yeah. what would be there. I spend a lot of time researching like the right kinds of trees that would be in each landscape. Nobody notices, I'm sure, but I know that I they're... I love it. I know that it's the correct I type of tree it. for that landscape. I love it because it gives me an idea of... Exactly what you're looking at. Like, yeah. fan art and like what kind of culture and art and clothes they would have. Yeah, and you've asked me that, like, what what would be, the, what do they eat and what yeah. what do they wear? And I've said it's what it depends on the land that they're in, f yeah. physically the land that they they are cultural. Yeah, at BookCon I gave you a herb arrangement. You did based on your brother, um, right? Yes. yes, it was awesome. Still have it. Yay. Um, so yeah, so I I can't not you know it's an it's a it's part of me being an ecologist. So when I'm world building, I think about the world that way. And when I was building the characters, I think about them that way. So I designed the sea fox, which is a character you see in Truth Witch, to hunt like a great white shark. Great whites have a very cool, unique hunting strategy that other sharks don't have. Uh, and I was telling the Jim Henson guy, the creature shop, head of the creature shop, yeah. that, and he was like. So impressed, it made my life. I was so I was like, I'm awesome, because he you was, are. he was just, he literally pulled me aside after was this really long meeting that we had, um, and he was like, I just want to say that I really appreciate you how you approach building creatures. He was like, I just can't stand creatures that don't make sense. And then he said, Fantastic beasts, <laughs> and I was like, uh -huh. as much as I love it, it's true. <laughs> so I felt like I got the ultimate compliment. You, that is an awesome I have ascended. Compliment. I have ascended. Yes. When you were coming up with the idea of the Witchlands, and it was starting, and you were first drafting, are you writing it the way that it first popped into your head, and you had the idea, or has it changed and evolved? It has definitely changed and evolved, because I, as a person, have changed and evolved. Um, I think my original vision for the series was much more light in tone, and I think Truth Witch is very fun. It's very light. Um, and there are still moments of brevity in all the books, but it gets more dark and intense yes, with each book. It does. Um, and part of that is my own life has gotten a lot darker and intense, and writing is, no matter what, a reflection of who you are in the moment. Um, but also it's, it's just where I realized the story actually needed to go and where these characters were going, because there are terrible things happening in their world, and that's going yes. to inform who they are and the choices they make. Yes. And I am, as a writer, it's very important to me to see real consequences Yes. You know, everyone shouldn't survive. Not that I'm going to kill everyone off, but you know what I mean. There should be consequences to yes. very high stakes. Like, um, it's always... Like Eleanor loses her hands. Yes. Like, there's, there always has to be a consequence to an action taken, but sometimes people don't realize that even in fantasy, it's it true. has to. It has to. And I, there's always a cause and effect. It should be, it should be a balance, too. What, then how big the scope is, what's at stake. If it's huge, then there need to be similar consequences for what they go yeah. through to achieve that goal. So, so yeah, it's definitely shifted in tone, and um, it's just gotten to be very big. It's a big world. So. Yes, and it's so awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. This is a funny question, because I had a awesome time thinking about it when I was writing it. In a battle of wits, who would win? Eleanor or Safi? Oh boy. Oh boy, they're so different. Safi is so sharp-tongued. I think she's, I think Eleanor is sharp-tongued, but I think Safi's even more sharp-tongued. And I think she's more impulsive, so it would really depend on the challenge, you know? <laughs> yeah. If it was like a challenge that required thoughtful, slow, like Safi would lose. <laughs> like slow, like you know, like, I don't know. Little, you have to solve this puzzle. Yeah, and drive them nuts. Like I don't think Safi would be good at solving mysteries. Eleanor is good at solving mysteries. Yeah, Safi doesn't have the patience for mysteries. No, but she has the patience to fish out who's lying and quickly. Yeah, it's true. It's true and quickly. I mean, it's just different. So yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. It's they have different wits about them. But that would be really cool to see. Be cool. I'd love I think they would get the along very well. Interact. I think they would get along very well. And our last question, 
Can you describe what's to come in Blood Witch in three words? Three words? Woo! <laughs> Give me a sec. Let's I mean, see. bloody is obviously one. Blood, yeah. <laughs> well, let's go with um, loss. Sounds ominous, I know. Oh, oh, um, okay. <laughs> loss, intensity, and um, hope. Ooh, that's a good one. It's not, an intense book, but I, I think there's a lot of hope in it. Not many people say that there's hope in the book when the when the writing really gritty stories. Yeah, this no, I mean that's one thing though. The Witch Lines gets gritty, but there's always hope. Yeah. It's a hopeful series at its heart. Yeah. Yes. And that is all the questions I have. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you so much. So for, for, thank you for oh, waiting goodness. so long to do it. So uh, I would have waited forever. <laughs> this is so well, exciting. Won't you do that, so and Bajman says, Hey. He's so cute. Who made him again? Um a reader. A reader did in yes. Florida. So anyway. He has also traveled around Morocco. He has, I believe and now on Sue tour. Has documented it on her Instagram. On Instagram, you can check that out. So Thank you, Jillian. You're welcome. Thanks. I would hug you, but... I'm sick, so... Yeah. We'll just do a... Bye! Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.